Hi readers, just a quick reminder that we are doing lesson 11 today. So we're skipping past lesson 10, which is a test lesson. We're going to do 11 today and 12 tomorrow. And then next class, reading class, we will have a test over lesson, the lesson 10 test, but it's going to look different than in your book. So don't work on the test in your book. We're going to do something a little bit different with it during distance learning. So skip 10 for now, go to lesson 11 today. Let's get started. All right, here we are on lesson 11. Touching column one, word one is Eskimo. What word? Good. Eskimos are native people that live in Alaska and Canada. Our next stories actually have Eskimos as characters, but scholars, we're going to be skipping that next group of stories. I'll tell you more about that later, so if you want to read any of them on your own, you can. Word two is sun. What word? Good. Word three is kayak. What word? Excellent. Word four is ordinary. What word? You got it. Word five is scientist. What word? Well done. Let's do column one the quick way. Back to the top. Here we go. Everybody ready with their pointer? Go. Eskimo. Sun. Kayak. Ordinary. Scientist. Let's go to column two. All of the words in column two are compound words. Remember, compound words are made from two words being put together to form a new word. So number one, any and more make any more. Number two, day and light make daylight. Number three, day and time make daytime. Number four, winter and time make winter time. And number five, rest and less make restless. Let's do column two the quick way. We're back at the top. Here we go. Anymore, daylight, daytime, winter time, restless. Moving to column three. Column three, scholars, all the words in column three are months of the year. Let's read them. Ready? Word one is January. Word two is March. Word three is December. Word four is February. Let's do those four words the quick way. Back to the top. Ready? January. March. December. February. Column four. All the words in column four have endings. Be careful. Make sure you don't drop those endings. Word one is reaches. What word? Good. Word two is honking. What word? Yes. Word three is friends. What word? Got it. Word four is splashing. What word? Excellent. Word five is tilted. What word? Tilted. Right? Be careful, not titled, tilted. Column four, the quick way. My finger's ready at the top. I'm waiting for you. Here we go. Reaches, honking, friends, splashing, tilted. Column five. Number one, those two words are Newman's Lake. What word? Good. Number two, 70. What word? Great. Word three is sir. Word four is constant. Word five is ignore. Word six is spear. Column five, the quick way. Newman's Lake, 70, Sir, Constant, Ignore, Spear. 
Scholars, this is a good time to pause and practice any of the vocabulary words you're not sure of. Otherwise, we're going to move to part B in just a moment. So part B, we're going to today be reading the next story about Henry and Tim. But first, we have an information passage that's going to give us more facts about the Earth. Let's read the title of that together. Ready? The Tilt of the Earth. The Earth is tilted. The poles are not straight up and down. Instead, they tilt. So scholars, if you take a look at those two pictures, picture one shows the way Earth would look if the poles were straight up and down. Picture two shows what the Earth looks like tilted. So the Earth is at a tilt as it's rotating around the sun. So we just learned the poles are not straight up and down. The Earth is tilted. And the poles tilt the same way as the Earth circles the sun. Picture three shows the tilt of the Earth during the different seasons. Touch the earth at winter time. The North Pole tilts away from the sun during winter. Let's say that rule together. Everyone ready? It's right up here. The North Pole tilts away from the sun during winter. You can see that half of the earth is in shadow and half is in sunlight. But the North Pole is completely in shadow. That means that as the Earth spins around and around during winter time, there is no daylight at the North Pole. There is constant darkness. Touch the Earth at summertime. The North Pole tilts toward the sun during summer. Let's say that rule. Everyone, it's right here. Ready? The North Pole tilts toward the sun during summer. Half the Earth is in shadow and half is in sunlight. But the North Pole tilts toward the sun, so it is completely in sunlight. That means that at the North Pole during summer, there is no night. There is daylight all the time during summer. The sun never sets. Remember, if the pole tilts away from the sun, it's winter time at the pole, and there is no daylight. If the pole tilts toward the sun, it is summertime, and there is no night. Pause for a moment, scholars, and read our information passage aloud. Then we'll continue to today's story. Part C, today's story. Ready? The flock reaches Florida. The next morning, before the flock took off, Henry tried out his wing. He took off from the field and flew around the lake. When he landed, Tim came up to him and said, I know what you were doing. You were trying to see if your wing is all right. Is it? It feels pretty good, Henry said with a smile. I can fly today. And he did. The leader of the flock honked out directions to the goose that would be at the point of the V. Then there were loud splashing and flapping sounds as more than 80 geese took off from Jackson Lake. 
Tim and old Henry took their place near the back of the V, and the flock went higher and higher. Why are we going so high? Tim asked. When we're up high, we'll be able to ride some winds that are blowing to Florida, toward Florida. We should be able to go far today without doing much work. The winds blew and the flock flew. Around noon, Henry told Tim, we're in Florida now. Wow, said Tim. That means we're almost at Crooked Lake. Henry laughed. <laughs> no, we still have a long way to go, and we won't get there today. It's more than 200 miles to Crooked Lake. Tim said, so where will we spend tonight? I don't know. Our flock always stops at Newman's Lake, which is about 70 miles from here. But I don't know where this flock lands. Less than two hours later, Henry found out where the flock would land. At Newman's Lake. So everyone, let's check in on a couple of things before we continue. What was the name of the lake that Henry's flock always landed at? Did you say Newman's Lake? Can you remember what state Newman's Lake is in? Right, Florida. Touch the lake where the geese spent the night. Did you say Jackson Lake and point at it? Good job. Touch the lake where they're going to land. Are you touching Newman's Lake? Now touch the key on the map that shows the miles. The, my, the key shows 100 miles, so scholars, if you use that key and kind of find maybe one of your fingers or thumb that's maybe about that size, and then you can try to use it to look at how far it is from Jackson Lake to Newman Lake, Newman's Lake. One, two, almost probably three of those. So about 300 miles between those lakes. And then you can see where Crooked Lake is. It's about 120 miles from Newman's Lake. Let's continue. There were lots and lots of geese around Newman's Lake. Tim said, it looks like all the geese in the world are right here. There are a lot of geese here, Henry said but wait until you see how many geese there are near Crooked Lake. The flock circled Newman's Lake and landed near a shore that was covered with geese. Some of them were honking and showing off by flapping their wings. Others were napping. The leader of the flock swam over to old Henry and said, We're going to spend tomorrow resting here. Then we'll go to Reedy Lake the next day. Do you plan to fly with us? Henry flapped his wings and said, I do. I feel fine. Tim smiled and said, Me too. So, two days later, Tim and Henry were flying high above Crooked Lake. Henry told Tim, This is where we leave the flock. Our lake is right down there. Old Henry flew up near the front of the great V and called to the leader. Thank you, sir, Henry said. You're a fine leader and you have a wonderful flock. We were glad to have the chance to fly with you. 
Scholars, I like the virtue that I'm seeing in Henry. I was so kind of him to say thank you. I always find that it's great to thank people when they've helped you in some way. Good luck to both of you, the leader said. Then Henry and Tim swooped down from the flock. I can't wait to see my mom and dad, Tim said. Henry was also looking forward to seeing his old friends and his children and grandchildren. But he also felt a little sad. As the two geese swooped closer and closer to the beautiful blue lake below, Henry knew that he would miss flying with Tim. This trip was the first time in years that Henry felt that somebody really needed his help. That was a good feeling for Henry. And that, scholars, is the end of our story for today. So I want you to pause for a moment, read this story aloud, right, to someone in your family, to a pet in your family, to a favorite stuffy. Read it aloud so you're practicing the story. Pause while you're doing that, and then we'll talk for a minute about your assignment. All right, scholars, so today's assignment for Lesson 11. The theme of a story is the underlying message, the big idea of the story. The author is trying to share an idea about life that is important. And scholars, I think we have a theme that runs throughout our stories about Henry and Tim, is virtue, right? And I chose three specific virtues that I thought fit in with our theme of virtue in our story. And you'll notice that there's some things to write. Sorry, I'm going to let that fire truck go by. So I live near a fire department, so we're just going to let them sail on by. And then we'll continue. So, fortitude is the theme of the stories about old Henry and Tim. Fortitude means having the courage to face challenges and obstacles. What is one example of fortitude in these stories? So here's the question, scholars, and it doesn't have to be just in today's story. Think of all we've been reading about Henry and Tim. Can you think of an example of fortitude? And I'm starting with a capital letter, and I'm going to use words from my question, right? One example of fortitude is when and then I'm going to put an ellipsis there so you can finish that thought of what, right, of an example of fortitude. So when did someone show fortitude? When was fortitude used? And then we're doing that same thing with justice, right? So what is one example of justice in these stories? And then same thing for prudence. What is one example of prudence? When did you see a character be prudent in his decision making? And then scholars double checking our rubric, right? Part of the question is in my answer, right? We did a sample one right up here starting out, right? I used a lot of words from that question. Then, right, you're getting a point for your fortitude answer, a point for your justice answer, a point for your prudence answer, and I'm looking at capital letters for your sentence, and because you're answering a sentence, it should have a period at the end, right? Because you're telling me an answer. So that is your work for today, tying in the theme of the story to some examples of when that theme was used. Good luck! <laughs>